non-Jew to the way. One of the most serious issues that uh, the very early Christians had was how to relate Judaism with people who weren't Jewish. And it's important to remember that all of the early Christians, all the founders of Christianity were Jewish. All the apostles were Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. In the book of Acts, Cornelius, a Roman centurion, has a vision in which God tells him to send for Peter, who is in the town of Joppa. As Cornelius' men are on their way, Peter goes up on the roof to pray. And he went into a trance or had a dream, and a sheet came down from heaven and the sheet was full of unclean animals. Now for a Jew, there were very strict dietary rules. There were clean foods and unclean foods. Peter, an observant Jew, is told in the vision to kill and eat the unclean or unkosher foods. And he refuses three times. And in the end, the voice says, what I have declared holy, don't you call unclean. Just then, Cornelius' servants arrive and ask Peter to come to Caesarea, to Cornelius' home. At first, Peter hesitates. He is fearful of entering a Gentile home. The dirty food and the dirty people are associated with each other. So Peter has to have this vision to say uh, that these people now are going to be regarded as clean by God, namely, namely Gentiles. In obedience to God, Peter goes to Cornelius' home with some other followers of the way. Once there, Peter is greeted by Cornelius and a large gathering of people. When Peter begins to preach, an amazing thing happens. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Peter, caught up in the moment, baptizes the entire household on the spot. In an instant, the entire nature of the church is changed. Now the church is not for a select few any longer. The gates of heaven, salvation is available to every single man and woman on earth. In converting the Gentiles, Peter takes the first bold step on the road to Christianity as we know it. It is a moment that will spark a revolution. When the Holy Spirit descends on the household of Cornelius, the Roman centurion, Peter and his fellow Jews are shocked. But Peter knows exactly what he has to do. He's called upon to baptize this man who is, uh, is not a part of the, of the Jewish community. I mean, that, is, that was a radical departure from what any of the other uh, sects of the day of Judaism would have done. Including his own. Although Peter is one of the leaders of the early church, the Jewish sect known as the followers of the way, he still has to explain his actions to his Jewish peers in Jerusalem. Peter appears before a council of apostles and believers. He's saying, this is not something that I did. This is not me going out there and saying, these Gentiles are OK. This is God's decision. God gives the Holy Spirit to those he chooses. And he's chosen to give it to these Gentiles. And we are not to question or exclude any longer. The council agrees with Peter.
while the early church internally struggles with the idea of Gentile converts, they also face persecution externally at the hands of the Roman and Jewish authorities. In the year 42 AD, King Herod Agrippa arrests some members of the church to persecute them and he orders the execution of the apostle, James, the brother of John. When he sees that it pleases the Jews, Herod then has Peter arrested. Peter is bound with two chains, sleeps between two guards, and several more guards are placed outside his cell. But then, according to scripture, the night before he is to be executed, an angel appears. We see Peter, and he's sound asleep. He's got enough peace and contentment in his life to be snoring on the eve of his death. And the angel actually has to come over and poke him to wake him up. Peter, in a daze, believes that he is having a vision. The chains fall off his wrists. And the angel leads him out of the cell, past the guards, and into the city. Once the angel leaves, Peter comes to his senses and runs to a house where other believers are gathered to pray for him. Once there, Peter relates what has just happened to him. It had been a miraculous deliverance from prison because God wasn't done with Peter yet. Peter had a job to do and God had to get him out of that prison and bring him back to get on with the task. And right after that, it says that Peter then went to another place. Most scholars believe that Peter leaves Jerusalem at that point to begin his missionary work. After Jesus, Peter was very preeminent according to scripture, you know, in the Acts of the Apostles. But then of course you have another person come on board, which is Paul. And Paul's from a whole new bent, a whole new story. Unlike Peter, Paul has never met Jesus and he is at one time the most virulent opponent of the early church. Paul begins his life as Saul of Tarsus, a religious Jew from Syria intent on rooting out the followers of the way. But Saul experiences a miraculous conversion on the way to Damascus in the year 36 AD. Also known as Paul, he immediately begins to preach the gospel to the Gentile world. He is particularly prominent in the church at Antioch. Paul has a powerful ally in Peter. But not everyone agrees with Paul's mission. There were a group of Jews in Jerusalem that went down to Antioch and said that the only way Gentiles could become Christians and become part of the church was if they were first circumcised and obeyed all the laws of Moses. In 49 AD, a council is held in Jerusalem to decide these matters once and for all. Peter, now in his early 50s, the apostles and elders of the church all attend. Paul and his companion Barnabas make the trip from Antioch and tell about the Gentile conversions. Peter stood up and supported Paul's position there and, and he said, Paul is right. 
that the Gentiles have a right to come into the Christian faith without going in through the door of Judaism. Peter now is declaring that the Gentiles don't need to be circumcised, that they can come in by faith. The council is swayed by Peter's argument. The Jerusalem Council of 49 AD is a watershed moment in the history of Christianity. In accepting Gentiles into the fold, Christianity moves away from its Jewish roots, forms its own ideas and practices, and flourishes. But the initial steps towards a more distinct religion are slow and difficult, especially for a man like Peter. A moment of weakness will set Peter against his ally, Paul. Although the decision to allow Gentiles or non-Jews into the church is made at the Jerusalem Council of 49 AD, it is not an easy transition, especially for a man like Peter. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, he recounts a visit by Peter to the Christian community of Antioch in the year 49 or 50 AD. Peter's behavior at Antioch is evidence that although he is a leader of the church, he is still capable of making mistakes. One of the core issues of the whole New Testament is how Gentiles and Jews can be brought into one body to eat together, to worship together, to serve this new Messiah together. And Peter had begun to live with the Gentiles and live like them. And some Jews came down from Jerusalem and when they got there, Peter was intimidated by them. Peter, it says, withdrew from the Gentiles and ate with the Jews. Paul then rebukes Peter, accusing him of hypocrisy and turning his back on the Gospels. If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? What happened here is Peter was not living consistently with what he taught. He had taught that the Jews and Gentiles were one in one body of Christ. Peter humbly accepts Paul's rebuke. After this confrontation with Paul in Antioch, very little is actually written about Peter in the official canon of Christianity. So what does he do? Where does he go? How does he assert his leadership of the way and fulfill Jesus' destiny for him as the rock upon which the church will be built? It seems that Peter, from the historical record that we have, travels around Asia Minor to Pontius, Bithynia, Galatia, and some others, and then ends up in Rome. And there's where Peter spends the last part of his life. But unlike Paul, Peter did not leave behind many written historical accounts of his time in Rome. If you say the name Peter, uh, most people would then think about Rome. I mean, after all, St. Peter's is in Rome. Uh, but what do we know about Peter in Rome? Well, if all we had in our hands were the 27 documents in the New Testament, uh, there'd be no way to think about Peter in Rome because there's nothing said about Peter being in Rome. But for those who go to the history and the documents and the archaeology of the early church, there is unquestioned evidence of Peter's existence in Rome, of having taught there, of having baptized people in the Tiber River. Two letters called 1 Peter and 2 Peter appear in the New Testament. There is some debate over their authenticity but they are purportedly written by Peter while imprisoned in Rome. In the first letter, Peter seeks to encourage the churches of Asia Minor in the face of persecution. He writes, For it is a credit to you, if being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you should follow in his steps. In the second, Peter warns against the danger of false messiahs. These people, however, are like irrational animals. 
mere creatures of instinct, born to be caught and killed. They slander what they do not understand. Peter's letters are the end result of a transformation. He is a brash and impetuous figure in the Gospels, who becomes a strong and stable leader in the Book of Acts. The Peter of the Epistles is now an older, wiser man who has faced persecutions and endured. In these letters, he passes on his knowledge and experience to the next generation of Christians. Peter's letters are allegedly written during the reign of the Emperor Nero, between 54 and 68 AD, a period when Christians in Rome are being ruthlessly persecuted. In 64 AD, a fire devastates the city. In an effort to deflect criticism from himself, Nero blames the Christians and sets about to punish them. According to a later document, this campaign may have led to Peter's martyrdom. Among the texts called the New Testament Apocrypha, meaning of doubtful authorship and authenticity, is a collection of stories about Peter in Rome called The Acts of Peter. There's a marvelous story uh, in the tradition of the church of Peter escaping from Rome. He's afraid. It had been predicted that he was going to be crucified. In John chapter 21, Jesus had said, your arms will be stretched out and they'll take you where you do not want to go, which was an illusion during that time of a crucifixion. Fleeing along the Appian Way, Peter sees Jesus walking towards Rome. Peter asks him, Domine, quo vadis? Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, because you're not willing to die for me, I have to come back in and take your place and die again. During his years,